All right. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome. And today, <laughs> Paul and his buoy. Um, we are going to be talking sort of about HyFlex, sort of about Zoom, but really the, the main design of this event came from looking at some um, surveys from Plymouth State faculty. I know not everybody here is Plymouth State, but um, Plymouth State faculty who basically said, um, this is really hard and we really appreciated your um, professional development this summer, but now that we are in it, there are some things that seem a little bit more murky than I had expected. Um, so what we're going to be specifically focusing on today is how can you retool and refigure at this point in the semester to capitalize on the things that are going well and maybe change up, maybe even significantly, some of the things that aren't going so well. So. Um, with that, I am going to share my screen. Just want to make sure I share the right one. There we go. All right. Hopefully, Google works today because it's been a little bit unhappy. Um, okay, so the first thing we're going to introduce here is, um, and actually, you know what we should also do, Martha, is can you just put the entire slide deck in the chat um, so that you can get to this deck and therefore click on links and stuff. Um, but one of the big things we're really hoping to do today, and then as this recording gets more traction, because more people will be watching it, no doubt, over the next few days, is that we are building out a crowdsourced set of tips and ideas that have worked for you. You'll see a couple examples in there. Um, Bob Nato from Plymouth State put an activity in that he's having really good luck with, um, that he's using across multiple sections of his classes, um, which are offered in a high flex modality. I put some things in there that are more like tiny tips. Um, we just wanted to show you that you can put anything into this Google Doc that is related to using Zoom, teaching online, high flex teaching, teaching during COVID. Um, what we really want is anything that you feel like, gosh, a lot of things maybe haven't worked, but this one thing, whether it's a small idea or a big one, has worked well for, for me. Um, so I encourage you, if you don't have time, like during the session here, to please make a little bit of time to add to that document because we'll be able to send that out again once it gets really well populated. I guarantee that that could be the most valuable thing that we get out of this session if people participate. So the first thing I wanted to show you, um, lots of you have attended these sessions, but if you are struggling with Zoom, we created um, two quick fast blasts focused on two things that people were especially struggling with. Um, breakout groups that felt unsuccessful or boring, um, and the black box dilemma, which is just you're teaching to a whole set of um, black boxes and feeling like you're not getting any live response. Um, Robin? Yeah. I don't know if you know this, but we're not seeing present on your slides. We're just seeing the edit. That's super weird because I'm only seeing the present. We are so. only seeing the edit. If you don't feel if you want to reach. I didn't know if you were doing that because there were notes you wanted to be able no, to show people. But, I was um, sharing it as far as this knew. So let's try one more time and see if they can do it. I don't really know what else to try, but let's try this. Okay, I'll share this. Um, and now I know you're seeing, but I'm gonna do this. Did it switch over? I mean, I literally switched it over. Okay. It not. Are, are you using two screens? No. Um, no. Although it's possible I am and I don't know that. <laughs> no. Do you want me to try? Yeah, you try because okay. I think something weird is going on. Oh, I just need you to stop share. Um, what's really great though is taking Zoom advice for, from someone who can't share their screen. <laughs> I promise I can share a Zoom screen. She's uh, done it many times. Done. Um, yeah, I don't know. Find the right, there we go. Are you okay. seeing it? Yep, we're seeing the edit screen, which you know. Is it presenting? I think so. Yep. All right. Okay, here we go. Now so we go. Pull us through this sucker, get us 
There we go. So anyway, um, I just want to remind you that those presentations are there so you can get some more info about uh, breakout groups and the black box dilemma. Um, they are embedded in this slide deck, but also when you click on that link uh, from the chat, you can um, go into the notes section and also get uh, the links to those resource pages so you can look at them separately. Um, so I don't want to spend a lot of time uh, talking about Zoom tips. Um, if you are struggling with other issues in Zoom, we can definitely help you. But I want to move um, through this to talk particularly about HyFlex. Some of you guys are teaching exclusively online, but you're still struggling, I think, with some of the same things that folks in the HyFlex um, situations are, are struggling with. Um, but I want to just say a couple of things to the people who are teaching in those dual modalities, right? Um, so you've got some people in the room and some people on Zoom. Um, and the first thing I want to say, and we'll go to the next slide, Oops. Um, is that uh, this is actually a quote from um, Brian Beatty's sort of definitive book on high flex, where they ran a study about um, course design and high flex. And actually one of the conclusions of the study was that a recommendation that faculty be paid at a higher rate than standalone traditional or online classes if they're teaching high flex. Now, it's probably not gonna happen that anyone's gonna mail you a check right now. But the reason I put that in there is that not only um, is this a recognition of the extra work that HyFlex takes, but I wanna remind you that a lot of people when HyFlex was kind of invented, they weren't necessarily teaching four HyFlex classes or three HyFlex classes at one time. They also had significant time to create a course specifically for the HyFlex um, modality, we've got a really different situation here, right? Where um, even if you worked through the course of the summer, um, you didn't have significant time on each course that you're teaching to set it up in these modalities. And most of you don't plan to teach in these modalities again. You don't plan to do high flex except during COVID. Um, so I just put that up here to kind of recognize that what we're doing now is still more like emergency remote teaching. It's not the way high flex was designed to be run. Um, let's go to the next one. Um, so one of the suggestions I think that Martha and I want to make, and we've kind of been making this from the beginning, but now I think it will resonate more, um, is let's, let's just try to do some less high flex. And you'll see that the spelling is different here. Um, the high flex tip, that H-I flex, that's Martha's high flex, which stands for highly flexible, versus the traditional high flex, which is um, hybrid flexible. So in hybrid flexible modalities, you teach both at once. In the Burtis modality, you think about the fact that you have asynchronous learners, um, you have synchronous online learners, and you have face-to-face -face learners. How can we teach them? Maybe we don't have to do it all at the same time, right? So what I would like to propose is that we remind ourselves that that was one of the main pieces of advice that we had in the collab was to think about flexibility, but not necessarily doing hybrid flexible in the classic sense. So many of you have found yourself teaching people on Zoom and people in the classroom at the same time, whether or not you fully intended it to go that way. So let's talk a little bit about how we can rethink doing that so you're not spread so thin, because there isn't anybody who thinks that that's a really, um, uh, functional way to teach, except in very extraordinary situations. So in the next slide, you'll see um, what I might suggest as a way of retooling is to think instead of organizing your course kind of like you run a theater um, or you run like student life activities or something like that. So forget about what your content is for a second, because obviously you're going to focus on teaching your content. Um, but instead of thinking about, I have class Tuesdays and Thursdays, two classes a week, could you instead think about what events do I wanna offer for my class this week to help people learn the content? So for example, you may have um, some asynchronous uh, content that is delivered for anybody in your class to access. You might have a video, for example, that you're posting. Um, you may have readings that people have to do, right? All that homework stuff that we used to call homework, right, is now 
the same thing, asynchronous online learning, they're doing it independently, they're doing it um, on their own time. But you may also plan um, synchronous events where people can show up um, on Zoom and hear a lecture or have a class discussion or do an activity using breakout groups. And you may have face-to-face -face learning where you say you can show up on Tuesday at 10 o'clock, we're gonna be in the classroom and here's what we're doing. Now, that means you don't have to offer the Zoom stuff at the same time as you're offering the face-to-face -face stuff. So a way of thinking about this is, um, could you, for example, if, you, if you're used to teaching synchronously from like 10 to 11.30 on a Tuesday, could you teach um, you know, 10 to 10.45 in an online modality and the rest of the class um, in the face-to-face -face modality? You should give yourself permission to cut the amount of seat time by half if you need to. If that's going to be better, because one of the things we're hearing from you guys is, gosh, nobody feels connected. I can't tell where my brain is. The students don't seem super happy. Um, if that's the case, don't keep doing that, right? It's okay to spend less time with your students um, if you are, for example, going to cut it and do the online students in one, one pod and the face-to-face -face students in another pod. And they could choose maybe which pod you know, they're going to attend. Um, so that, that's one possibility of sort of like cutting the seat time. The other is to think of it as like a choose three of five kind of things, right? So you say to your students, you know, here's, here's seven things this week. You need to choose four of these things. Um, and, or you need to choose one thing from each of these three categories, right? So think of it a little bit like you're, you're scheduling different events and not so much like you're running a class where everybody has to be pleased at the same time, right? Or in the same way. Um, so it's gonna be different depending on your content and what you do. Um, but I think lots of us have fallen into the trap of thinking that we absolutely have to deliver this um, at the same time to people on Zoom and people in the classroom. By all means, if that's working even a little bit for you, it's a very efficient way to do it. So keep on doing it because um, efficiency counts. It's, it's part of your labor. But if it's not working for you, um, do away with it. Um, and one way of figuring out if it's working for you, because I, I have heard that some faculty are like, this is hellish. And then they ask their students and the students are like, yeah, it's fine. It's good. <laughs> you know, so make sure you check with them. But that's my suggestion is um, talk with your students and say, I'm thinking about not this week, you know, this week we'll stay with what we planned, but next week I'm thinking about switching it up a little bit so we can be more focused in these ways. What do you think? Um, or ask them how the, the class is going for them and um, how they think it could be re-delivered in a different way. And then you can take a weekend and, and work on that and roll it out the next week. So there's no rush here. Um, but being in touch with your students, I think, would be a helpful way to determine um, whether you want to switch into kind of a more upcoming events kind of a model. Uh, let's go to the next one. Um, the idea here is that you are a little bit maybe less like a uh, teacher and more like an event planner. Um, and I think that's great because you think of it to a certain degree of, I mean, you know, you're still a teacher. I don't mean like give it up and become Martha Stewart, but I mean, um, events are fun you know events are engaging um people know why they're coming to an event there's sort of a, a goal in the event so maybe it would be helpful instead of thinking about like i have to teach this class in a modality that's like really very different from any class you've ever taught before think instead about your events and you can have like martha and i this week we did a whole series of 15 minute events they worked great. People showed up. We got shit done. We did it. They were, you know, well reviewed. They were energetic. <clears throat> an event does not have to be a two hour thing. It doesn't have to take an hour and 15 minutes like a class. You can break these things up in multiple different ways. So my biggest advice to you is if your traditional high flex offered in a traditional modality, or if you've moved your course to a fully online course, but you're totally following Tuesday, Thursday, 10 to 11, 15, and you've got that stuck in your head, I just want to remind you, it's a global pandemic. Martha Stewart encourages you to think outside the box of how you deliver your curriculum. Listen to your students and think about, gosh, 
you know, it may not be classic seat time the way I'm used to. It may not look as much like the course as it used to look, but we are going to have um, more engaged students. I'm still going to be able to meet my content. Okay, next sucker. Um, so I want to remind you that when we introduced um, hybrid flexible as a, um, when we introduced highly flexible as opposed to hybrid flexible, we, we rolled out there four different models that um, Martha had suggested and, and she's going to talk about them briefly. But the main um, thing I want to remind you of these models is I think we may have emphasized when we rolled them out the first time, pick any one of these, you know, and you could run your course that way. But now as Martha and I are also learning more, we're realizing you can actually really pick all of these and use them interchangeably as a way of running different events. So I'm just gonna ask Martha to kind of refresh our memory about what these four models are. Um, they can be used for those of you who are teaching some face-to-face -face and some online, but lots of these will be really helpful for those of you who are also teaching exclusively online and you're trying to think about how to use that time with your students. Yeah. The um you know, the the backstory to all the models is basically the same and the very, I mean, if you, if you looked at this infographic closely during ACE, you would have realized the, the dirty secret, which is that the, the first three were basically the same model um, with slightly different inflections. But the core idea is that you actually design really for an online class, like you make this assumption that there, if a student wanted to, they could never come to a face-to-face -face session um, and never be synchronous and still could successfully complete your course. And then you sort of reverse engineer from that into the face-to-face -face or synchronous experience and think about those face-to-face -face and synchronous experience as ways to kind of augment, delve more deeply or align student learning. Um, maybe through events like Robin is talking about um, that kind of inflect or, or um, explore something that's happening within the online curriculum you've developed, but that are not necessarily the kind of thing that if a student wasn't at that um, face to face or synchronous opportunity, they would be at a really um, um, They would suffer in terms of their experience of the course. And the three different models are really just different variations on that the small group teaching, which is really kind of taken on the British tutorial model where that's just, that's kind of something a lot of older British universities have done for a while, where instead of having big classrooms, small groups would meet um, to talk about um, readings or topics together with a, with a tutor. Um, small group meetings, which is really great for classes where maybe you're doing group work. Um, and so what you're facilitating are using those synchronous um, and on um, and face to face times is for is to get together as groups and work through uh, projects or assignments or um, uh, Some sort of experience together and then finally small lab or hands on work for those kinds of classes that really do require some kind the last model is model four, which some of you may remember who were part of ACE is really about breaking down um, a lot of traditional walls in the classroom and really thinking about your class more as a flexible learning community where you and your students co create um, as much as possible, the curriculum, the work, the assignments, the schedule. Um, that may be a tricky um, switch to flip at this point in the semester, if that feels like a complete 180 from what you've been doing up to now, but that doesn't mean that you can't do some of this at any point, um, I would say in the term. As Robin mentioned, with any of these things, if you feel like what's being suggested is really different from what you've been doing so far, we always encourage you having an open conversation with your students um, about the change, not just making a decision and hoping this is better. Um, your students really are such a resource to you when it comes to this. Um, and you'd be surprised how many of them appreciate being invited into this conversation. Um, as long as you're responsive, you know, as long as you listen and are, and are responsive to the things they may suggest or the ideas they may have. That doesn't mean that you do what everybody asks for. You can't make everybody happy necessarily all at once, but it does mean that you have a, you know, a, an honest, open conversation about what's going well, what's not going well, and some ideas you might have to try something different um, and invite them to make suggestions as well. If you really are feeling like you, what you've designed so far has been a true high flex in the more traditional way, definition of high flex where you're teaching, 
um, face to face and online synchronously at the same time and then providing back you know, some version of that experience for asynchronous students. If that's what you've been doing up until now and you're thinking, I really don't think I can make a change, but I, I, I need help doing that. It's just, it, logistically it's complicated um, and, and I'm having trouble kind of wrapping my head around it and doing it well. Um, we have put together, and I'm so glad that Kayla is here because she's part of the inspiration for this. Um, an assignment that she shared that she did in one of her TWPs. I think she shared it with the uh, cluster pedagogy learning community a few weeks ago. Um, and what was so great, what she modeled for us there was um, a plan that she developed. Um, <laughs> there you are, Kayla. And um, really spent some time before doing the assignment in class, really thinking through um, what needed to, how the class needed to unfold, what she needed to do in order to help students work through a particular assignment that day. Um, this is kind of a little planning document that's a little bit like what Kayla put together. It's based also loosely on something that I do when I'm just teaching traditionally. I always have a piece of paper that I actually take into class with me. That is, that's what I use if I'm taking attendance where I have notes about the things I know I need to cover. The attendance sheet is actually even less about taking attendance and more about reminding myself about things I need to talk to certain students about. Um, and so I, and I print it out and take it with me because if it's on paper, I don't have to worry about the technology for that piece of it. I literally put it in like a three ring binder that I carry and add to every week. Um, so this is kind of a version of that, but a little bit augmented with the kinds of things that Kayla did, where before you even go into the class session, you think about, okay, what do I need to think about for my face-to-face -face classes? What do I need to think about for my online students? Um, what's the same and different? Um, what are the different pieces that we're gonna be working on? And how do I deal with those two different audiences? And then, and then go back and say, okay, based on all of that, what do I need to make sure I've prepared before I go into class? What resources or links do I need to have access to? And then at the end, what do I need to do to take whatever we generated or created to share it with my asynchronous students? It's, there is nothing like magical about this. It's just a planning document. But for a lot of us, I think you've been teaching long enough that you're like, I, I've never had to do that. <laughs> you know, I've never had to do that kind of really nitty gritty formulaic planning because the normal face-to-face -face, um, classroom experience is just has become so natural. Um, and what you're doing right now is not natural. <laughs> so if this is useful to you, the document is linked here. You can comment, um, copy it and, and make as many copies as you want for different weeks. And oh, I clicked on the link accidentally. And that's in the chat as well. And I keep clicking on the link accidentally. I'm just going to do this instead. Um, so the next slide, um, we just wanna talk really briefly about this next topic, which there is, it is never too late to be thinking about community in your class. We definitely heard from some people in our faculty survey that they were struggling with this, that they felt like in the past, they've never had trouble having students come together in a community, but with students in different modalities and that shifting from session to session as students decided to do different things, um, they just felt like things weren't coalescing um, into a community. Don't feel like because we're in week five, you know, that ship has sailed, it's too late. Um, I don't think that's ever the case. This is a link to a blog post that I wrote a few weeks ago that brought together a bunch of ideas and resources around um, classroom connection and creating community. Um, and <laughs> the technology just does not like me today. Um, these are a couple of just tips to keep in mind as you are approaching this. One, the first two of which are really more about you. First of all, be patient with yourself because again, what you are doing right now is hard because it is hard. Not because you have failed in some way, but because you have been asked to do something that is really, really difficult. And just the fact that you are sticking with it and continuing to try to figure out is why your students are lucky to have you. Um, the second of which is that some of times unfa unfamiliarity, unfamiliar things feel unfamiliar and it takes a while for us to adjust to that. Um, so you may already feel in week five a little bit better than you felt in week three when you filled out our survey. 
um, because you've started like it's almost like um, like muscle memory like your muscles have started to adjust to the things and the routine the new routines that you need to to work through in another two weeks it'll be even a little better you probably won't get to the end of the semester and say wow i really like that i hope i keep get, i can continue this for the rest of my career but you will get to a place where it will feel a little bit less like every class you're just starting fresh all over again the other two things are a little bit more practical especially with zoom you know we, we all are accustomed to certain kinds of cues in the classroom ways that students cue to us their interest their disinterest their confusion um, that they have something to say that they're feeling shy or confused or concerned we we pick up on that that kind of um, body language and tacit um, uh, language that emerges in a community like that that's really hard when you have students who are, are on zoom particularly if they're keeping their video off um, so there are definitely when their video is on there are definitely new cues that we can look for so one of the things to do is to start paying attention to what those new cues might be one of my former colleagues um, uh, Jesse Stommel was talking this spring about how he had started to learn after a few weeks that when people sort of lean forward that often means that they're they actually have something to say um, and so starting to pay attention to things like that you can even have conversations you know in your class with your students and say we need to it reminds me of when my kids were in elementary school they'd have these hand signals that they give their teachers like i need to go to the bathroom i have a question this person is bothering me whatever um and because the teacher didn't want everybody yelling all the time they'd use these hand signals like an umpire or something maybe developing some new language with your students that helps those those zoom participants to signal needs um, in a way that may be completely new and different but helps everybody to kind of be aware of the people in the room not just in the physical room but in the larger room and i um, think that is kind of um, specifically some of the tips that i put into the google doc are really about what affordances does zoom have to help you do that so you'll see i think at least two of my tips are related specifically to those new cues that you can use if you want and then some of the things that we talked about this week in the 15 minute workshop that i did yesterday also about encouraging more playful and spontaneous interaction using as robin said some of the some of the things that are just part of zoom profile pictures um, backgrounds um, back channel chat um, don't feel like zoom is making the rules <laughs> Right, Zoom is a tool, it has affordances, you get to decide how you use those affordances, you can use them in unexpected ways. Um, and you can have your a conversation with your students about that. I'm not going to go through all of these in great detail, but these are the blog posts that I linked to on the previous slide also includes lots of suggestions that I kind of crowdsourced a conversation on Twitter about for icebreaker and community building activities. I just pulled these five out, but there's lots more. Um, the main one I want to draw your attention to is this one, which is links to a blog post by Deanna Maskey about um, handcrafted icebreakers. And she, she's she been doing this for a long time. And basically what she says is icebreakers are great, but if you actually, well, actually sometimes icebreakers are not great. We all know that icebreakers can be great, but really they're only really great when they're handcrafted to the course and the experience. So if you've done icebreakers in the past and you're like, meh, maybe it's because the icebreaker you chose did not really intersect in any meaningful way with the community that you're trying to build around the course that you're teaching so maybe t looking at various icebreaker ideas and thinking huh that's interesting is there a way that i could tie this to conversations that we've had in class to the kinds of students i know that i'm teaching the kinds of experiences that i know that they're having so that it really begins to resonate um, and it's through those kinds of experiences that you're likely to see more true community emerge these are just a couple of other examples. You're welcome to explore these when you take a look at the slide deck. But like I said, that blog post that I linked to has links to lots more. And let's just like go back for a second to yeah. thinking about. Um, but did you actually mean go back? No. Okay. But um, to thinking about the kind of calendar of events, right? To think uh, less in course, you know, class chunks and more about tailoring an experience for a particular moment in time in a particular modality. Um, so some of those icebreakers could be incorporated into that. So for example, if you're doing a thing 
um, you know, you, you might have, um, for example, a required lecture. Maybe it's even offered high flex because you're basically just lecturing for 15 or 20 minutes and people can, you know, watch you however they want. Then immediately following that lecture, you have a face-to-face -face conversation with the people in the class only. Um, but the, the online people come back at another time for an online conversation with you when you're at home. I was going to say with a glass of wine, but probably not. But when you're at home in your comfortable chair, you can have that Zoom conversation. But some of these icebreakery things can be worked into some of that stuff too. Um, and you can also, if you've got, maybe you've got a lecture and you've got a discussion and whatever, you can work in some of these more fun community building things. You know, I'm thinking if you have an icebreaker, that is related, say, to archaeology, and people need to find an object in their house, you know, and, and sort of like archaeologize that object, tell the story, whatever. And it's really an icebreaker. It's loosely linked to your content. But these can be kind of um, 15 or 20 minute <laughs> events that happen in multiple um, modalities, but particularly at multiple times. You may find um, that instead of teaching for an hour and 15 minutes on a Thursday, you're offering four different of these experiences at different times that really fit with your schedule, you know, whenever they may be. Um, so when you're working in your content into that events calendar, you can also work in community building. And especially if you wanna say like choose from certain categories, there may be some things that are community building. The one thing I would say is if you do move to something like that, you've got to really think about your um, communication with your students. Because one thing you don't want to do is, you know, here we are midway in the semester, you're going to like change up the delivery when one thing everybody knows about online learning is you want to be really clear and really consistent, right? Um, so we're going to change up the delivery. Let's make sure before you roll it out that you really have a good place to post the information that's reliable whether you're using moodle or a website um, but we probably don't want to be emailing them every day saying like here's a new schedule of events for today right so if that's the kind of thing you need help with you're like oh i'd like to try this but all i have is this old paper syllabus that i you know it's a word doc i put it online like i don't i don't know how to organize something like this that's the kind of thing that particularly Martha, um, like a, a conversation with Martha, a conversation with me, we can, in the course of 45 minutes or so, we can help you build something that you feel comfortable using for that kind of communication. Um, this also relates back to that modular idea we talked about over the summer, which is that it, instead of thinking about, okay, how am I gonna do the rest of the semester? You might say to your students, hey, we've been doing this, it's been great, um, or not, but for the next two weeks, we're going to move to this new events calendar. Um, and then we will, you know, assess after that and we will give you the next module. So you don't need to redesign your entire course. You can take a break from your, your old delivery method, try something new for a discrete period of time, like two weeks, and then tweak and deliver two more weeks after that. Um, I will tell you that the person who lives in my house, um, Phil, in some ways turned out in a fake syllabus at the beginning of the semester for whatever like syllabus police exist at Plymouth State, because I basically said to him, do not plan more than two, three weeks at a time, because you're doing a lot of new things and you don't really know how it's going to go. So if you want to make some modifications now, my suggestion is don't commit to them, you know, for the long haul, try something for two or three weeks, see what they like. And then a, a really cool thing to do would be to build in an event, half an hour called, let's design the rest of the course. And I don't mean like, what are we reading? What are we studying? But do they want to go back to the, to the model you used at the beginning? Do they want to do this? Do they have some tweaks? How could you organize the remaining part of the semester? That also helps just in case COVID changes the landscape a little bit. Everybody's known that in a couple of weeks, we're going to check back in and see. Um, two weeks can maybe be a little short, but I would say three weeks, like you don't want to go any beyond that um, because we don't know how, how it's going to feel for you. So those are our best suggestions. It's really about doing a big rethink about delivery and don't feel so forced into your 
your class architecture. If you need to break it up a little bit so that you're not doing too much at one time, it's okay to put things into smaller chunks and, and um, not feel like you have to bite off a whole traditional class the way you used to in your old um, modality. So with that, we will take conversation questions and just remind you about that doc because if that gets built out, you know, all of you have at least one thing that you're like, I'm pretty proud of how that thing works. If you put that in there, um, people are really gonna benefit. So feel free, just unmute um, and tell us what you're thinking or uh, what else you need. And if you need to leave now, that is also fine. Um, I'm gonna start, stop recording.